Welcome to the Creativity Lab, the podcast that shows how to channel your creativity to live your best, most beautiful life. And now here's your host, director of the Creativity Lab at West Los Angeles College, Harvard PhD, TV writer and professor, Dr. Katherine Boutry. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Each episode, we discuss creative challenges. Today, I have the honor of talking to acclaimed Los Angeles-based artist Joshua Elias about creative passion, the birth of a painting, making time and space for your art, and whether artists see the world differently. An abstract artist, writer, and poet, Joshua has received artist residencies in Spain and France, and his works have been exhibited throughout the world, most recently in Rome and Tokyo. Joshua's paintings have appeared in multiple publications and have been acquired by many private and public collectors, including the Rand Corporation, Viceroy Hotels International, and the President of Iceland. Joshua's art studio is at the Brewery Complex in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're really honored to have you. It is a pleasure. Glad to be here. I'm curious because you call yourself both a painter and a poet. Do those two things intersect for you all the time, or are they completely separate? Um, they do. Um, there's, I guess my painting is um, connected with lyricism and lyrical things, and uh, I love poetry. I'm actually working on a poem now to learn called L'Infinito, which is the infinite, mm. by a, a, an Italian poet named Leopardi. That's very beautiful, and it actually has very painterly images in it. And while it's not a direct thing where I do poetry and painting, it is uh, connected in, in kind of an indirect way. A lot of things come kind of over here. I take them in, mm -hmm. and then I paint. So the poem, L'Infinito, mm -hmm. is the inspiration for a painting that you're doing now. So, well, I think a series of works, actually, oh, wow. because um, yeah, it's about looking over the hedge with the the horizont the horizons being. Um, I'm learning it in Italian, and I don't know Italian fully, so or I know a little bit. And it's there's it's there's part of the view is blocked, which has always interested me. When something is uh, obfuscated, it, it's sometimes when things are blocked, people are more more apt to look. Mm -hmm. They want to peek through the door a lot. It, it's it's an entry point into a painting. Because people are curious? Yes, and they like to uh, look where they're not supposed to look. <laughs> that is true. We all do. It's, and there's you know, a mystery. Yeah, there's a mystery. If it's just all, all given to you, it's, it's, you know, it, the resonance is like you know, zero. It's just, okay, got it. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, a, it's an image. It's not necessarily uh, an experience. When did you know you wanted to become an artist? Had, have you always seen the world a little bit differently? Well, yeah. I, I was always, I was a, I think a funny kid, but I never, um, I wasn't really good at keeping secrets, which is probably not a surprise. <laughs> Yet I probably always wanted to be a spy, <laughs> which somehow wouldn't have worked out very well, I don't think. It would have been a short career. So um, if you couldn't be a spy, why not be an artist? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I could tell you a poet, like uh, I grew up in Chicago and uh, we used to go up to Lake Michigan in the summertime. And I must have been about five or six and I, um, we were at the shore, they called it, <laughs> not even the ocean, it was, or not the lake. And Lake Michigan is pretty vast, and it's not full of salt where you just go right down, you know, mm. that kind of thing. But I was there, and I picked up a rock that was really porous. How old are you now at this point? Five or six, and I, it was really light, and it floated in the water, and this mm. is not salt water. It was the, so it got me... Of course, I was a fan of the astronauts, and I was like looking to the sky, you know, and I was like, and I think it was a meteorite or something, mm. but like it was only about this big. I, I had it for like 20 years, you know, hung on to it. But um, it got me questioning things, and that's what an artist does. Mm. An artist looks at things, and it, they're not accepting things always as they are, but they're looking deeper into, uh, in, from my opinion, they're looking deeper into the meaning of things and they're articulating that understanding without being heavy-handed about mm -hmm. it. Because of the medium? Because it's visual? Well, if or you go, well, well, well I'm working in an analog field. I'm not a digital artist. Uh, I'm not a performance artist, although I've done some performing. Um, and 
you know, someone goes up to your painting and they're addressing it. It's still, <laughs> they're still for a moment in this world that is in constant motion. And so um, for that reason, I think, I don't know if that explains it. What did your journey look like from five-year-old to successful artist sitting here? My mother's an artist and my sister is an artist. And my sister was kind of known as the artist kid, really. I was not. I was kind of doing it on the sly or something. And um, I don't know, when I was about 16 or 17, for various reasons, my mother and I were alone living in a house in uh, Bexley, Ohio, where I went to high school. Uh -huh. And she took me to a mansion, which was uh, a gallery, which is now from the Pace Gallery, which is the largest gallery in the mm -hmm. world. But this was the grandmother, uh, Mrs. Glimsher, and she had an artist there, um, Louise Nevelson, mm. who's a great artist, and she was there. Wow. And I got to meet her, you know, and I thought I was cool. I was 17 drinking champagne, and it was all really, you know, great. And I was going in the back room with the owners, the grandson, and we were like going through Picassos, like, wow. not very carefully. <laughs> we're just rifling through paintings. Oh, that's cool. That's a, I like that one, you know. And then, um, and I thought that was really special to see uh, Louise Nevelson's sculptures. She does these black sculptures, beautiful sculptures. And and I met her and the energy from her hand. She said, you're an artist. And you know, I also could just feel, it was like, it was like a, an electrical mm. thing going on there. I was like, wow, this is, uh, it was almost like a club or something. I was, you know, I never really felt like I belonged in anything, which is, mm a criterion for an artist, but, but um, not belonging. that's correct. Mm. That's correct. So that was a little bit of that. That was like a moment for you. Yeah. And there, was there a it, ring of recognition for no, you? No, it took many years, mm. many years. Uh, I didn't start painting till I was 25. I went to film school. I was doing radio. I went to uh, a junior college. I went to Pierce College. Was what was doing. that like for you? Um, I was just getting used to California and I was interested in girls and, you know, and parting and that kind of thing and um, but radio was fun to do and so I was doing I was playing with sound a lot and editing and doing interviews and um, uh, like this I guess <laughs> but in those days we would you'd interview someone they would speak for minutes and then you'd pretend you asked the questions that they're answering. <laughs> they would just talk, 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 and then I would insert the questions and then edit it together. It was a little backward thing. What was that like? It was, it was interesting, it was very eclectic. And um, there were people from all different uh, fields, some people that were Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. there, some people that were uh, like me, some people like California girls that you would imagine out of the songs in the 70s, you know. Um, and um, I was just kind of getting my feet wet. And then I went to, to university in San Diego, San Diego State. And then I did radio and film, and I made little films. And then uh, got involved in some theater and uh, came back to Los Angeles. I did a, some theater, some plays, some Bertolt Brecht plays and stuff. And then I had a wild years in the Hollywood with, um, not Hollywood, Hollywood, but Hollywood. I, I designed these sunglasses made out of 35 millimeter film and started to market them and um, had like a no business acumen, but started to, and it was kind of an artistic venture as well. I was taking sure. Roscoe Lane. I had sprocket holes made. They used to have this thing called film. So, you know, and, uh, and, and where they had sprocket holes in there, these little dots, you know, it perforated. And there was like six machines that made those in all of Los Angeles. And the guy was doing me a favor while they were doing Indiana Jones. You know, oh, he wow. was doing my little film classes. And they had silver on the side and made in Hollywood. And I thought they were really cool. They rolled up in film canisters. And I got involved with taking something, reappropriating it. And then I was taking courses at Otis and then Santa Monica City College, even another one, you know, and drawing and painting. And so that was a little bit of my journey. And then I started really seriously painting around 1986, 85, 86. And was that a decision you made just to have painting be your full time? No, I was working three jobs mm. for years, 
probably 14 years, 15 years. I was, uh, I was catering. I was selling B movies. I was, uh, I was. Uh, at one point, I brought authors around to media events. Mm. Um, all sound like interesting jobs, but they weren't. You know, there's a difference between a job and a career. Right. So you made the decision. Right. I made the decision to. Um, to paint full time in probably 97. I produced a meditation tape and did that and done a lot of projects and things and had shown my art already um, and had sold work already from the outset, but um, was nervous as all hell to, to, you know, to do it full time. Sure. The family was not in town and they were a little concerned. <laughs> What are you going to do? I'm going to paint. Yeah, well, I know, but what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, and even though my mother was a painter, she, you know, wasn't her, she didn't have to live off it. So um, I then got my neighbor, some different things happened. Um, my neighbor was doing a project at a hotel and with a designer, and it was a major, wanted to be a major designer named Kelly Wurstler. So I wound up getting a commission for 48 paintings. Wow, that's not for, nothing. Yeah, yeah, and they weren't huge paintings. They were 24 by 30 something, or 36, something like that. For me, they weren't huge. So I got a studio and, uh, you know, and uh, it was, you know, a lot to do. And I did them in months, like in two, I was just like so wow. uber focused and no cell phone in my studio, no phone, you know, I was just like doing it. and. That rolled into collectors buying them, into the extra ones. I did extra, I did, you know, and then she had other jobs for me, and then I was showing, and it got me kick-started in a way that uh, pretty much I, I've done that full-time since. And you've mentioned in other interviews that humor is a part of your art, it's a part of your titles that Definitely you're known titles. for. How does yeah. that, do, tell me about that. It's, it's interesting that serious art doesn't have to be serious all the time. Well, strangely enough, when I'm painting, uh, many times the titles just come to me. Give um, me an example of your favorite. Well, uh, a poetic one is like the skin of the sun or the mm. skin of the earth. I did a couple of those. and. If I had to literally tell you what that means, I couldn't even tell you. It felt like something very thin, very fragile, and very delicate and very beautiful. So that's kind of a, a poetic title. Um, some were long-winded and looking back, you know, and uh, sometimes I change titles, but um, usually they come to me in the middle of painting. I swear, it's like a voice that comes in, and this is the title of this painting, and it helps move the painting forward and it helps me be clear about what I'm what I'm doing. How is a painting born? You know, what is your is it How's it born? Yeah. You know, what do you just start with a paint blotch mm. and, and then uh, first I decide on the dimensions. Uh-huh. Oh I, really? The, yeah, the size. Yeah, yeah, the size. I have my canvases made for many years. Um, I don't stretch my own canvases. Um, I like the number 9. I'm a little ritualistic and some of this is like you know you're probably rolling your eyes but I'm but, not at uh, all my favorite number is 26 oh okay <laughs> right right nine is complete like you can multiply nine times five it's 45 you four plus five it, it, it no matter what mm. you add it up it turns into nine so I like the idea of something that's contained and also kind of infinite at the same time so my canvas sizes are like 50 by 40 often I don't always do this 54 by 45 they equal nine usually oh. in some weird way, 63 by 54. They're very specific, and mm. since I get them made, I'm not buying them off the shelf where they have to be standard and stuff like that. And those sizes, a lot of them work for me very well. And um, so that's one decision right off the bat. So every decision you make is, is the birth of a painting. Uh, I have a nice studio, very large studio, and I hang work up, uh, I hang rather the canvases up, usually uh, naked, you know, for a few days. The canvases or you? Oh, oh, both. <laughs> Why is that wrong? <laughs> no, no, just the canvases. Uh, you know, that, I hang myself up another time. But, but, but as far as, as, far as making paintings, um, then I kind of have a, I look at it and I kind of think about some things. 
Then I usually operate, for me, color is key. I'm a colorist for sure. And I work in usually two or three colors um, to begin with and variations of such. And that might get a little complicated, but basically like there's primary colors and secondary colors. And so I find ways of almost canceling out the color or doing half tones and tones, mm. like something like orange, the opposite of orange is, is blue. Depends on the orange and the blue, right? But so I might add a little bit of blue into the orange and make that orange. Mm. So it's not just straight ahead orange out of the tube. Yeah, I rarely do that. I usually mix colors and then find it. And I have a very good memory. So, and I also don't clean my brushes over the days. And so I leave it there and I work on, so this part about the birth of a painting, I, I work on some very, very large tables for the last 15 years, the same tables. Mm. Often they become my palettes, even though I use, I put the paint right on there and it reminds me of the color. So I know how to match colors. I can match any color just pretty much these days. And then and then I use, uh, so so the, meanwhile the canvas is naked, I'm looking at it, and many times I start from the upper left part of the canvas. Um, I used to teach art and I told my students, you know, we all have proclivities, you know, things that, that we prefer to do, you know, your first impulse might be a big circle in the center, Kathy, or something sure. like that. So mine is, they said, what's yours? And I didn't really think about it. I had to think about it. And I start in the upper left-hand corner, and I kind of wipe it out because I kind of want to make more of an organic shape to begin with. Anyhow, it doesn't always stay there. In recent years, maybe I'm getting older, I, I, there's a more formality where I'm doing some straight lines and things and everything's not curved and like this. But, um, but uh, so the painting begins like that and um, I do it in a very non-self-conscious way and I have some music on usually that doesn't have any words that's very kind of vibrational and tonal. And I turn my phone off, and I'm not not on my computer and stuff. Because like that. words might influence you. Yeah, yeah, or... yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to like, you know, riff on a song that's maybe a ballad or something, mm -hmm. and then that's maybe not what this painting is about, you know. So, and um, sometimes I use cues like poetry or something like that beforehand, mm -hmm. and um, I see a lot of art too. I watch a lot of art, so also that is my influence. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So you don't have it fully formed in your mind before you start. You let it emerge. Right, right. Although I do have a, a, a language, a visual language, after all these years, that I find things repeat themselves. Um, I think a lot about uh, Da Vinci and the ground plane and, you know, basic landscape of grass is green, you know, ocean, ocean is blue, sky, space. Um, um, and the reason I keep it in three colors often is I seem to um, always want to allow space in the canvas for the forms to be able to uh, come out. And, and, a little and bit speak. like Michelangelo, Michael, Michelangelo and David, right? Doesn't right, he and he was a sculptor mm -hmm. first, but, even but though his, yeah, yeah, in, in David, right, exactly. Yeah. That David emerged from the stone, Right, from well, he was, yeah, yeah, he was incredible, yeah, yeah. Like Pieta, he had the exact size marble or something, and he could make no mistakes, and that was, you know. Well, those guys were gods themselves, <laughs> and at another level, and uh, the more you see it, the more you realize, like, okay, just, I mean, yeah. There, mm -hmm. Hearing you talk about canceling out colors makes me think that there might be sort of a theme for you because I remember reading and I think it was your artist statement, I read in print, mm -hmm. that you talked about painting and you talked about the powers of painting and there's a lot of contradictions in them. The way that you describe them, you mm -hmm. talk about illuminating stillness, mm -hmm. defying gravity, mm -hmm. um, that it can send you places if you're not grounded. That it's Right, of, there's interest interspersal, I guess, you know, the interstitial, actually, space between you and I. So I'm looking at you right now. There's stuff going on right here. Mm. And sometimes I respond to that, even in life. I don't, I don't, I'm not a different person when I go paint, necessarily, although I do get in a very, very focused state. Um, so that inter 
stitchal space is kind of a way to create space. And a one way to create space, if you, colors cancel each other out, there's something called bister, B-I-S-T-R-E. And it could make kind of a grayish tone, but it, it, with color, it's very str- And when you look around you, uh, most things are space. Mm. <laughs> and, but if it's too ethereal, uh, what I wrote, it, you know, it could fly off the canvas, <laughs> right? I get it. So what I've worked on, even like in large canvases, like I did some fairly large, 63 inches high by 54 inches wide. The bottom, I have an edge of something. So if the painting has a movement that's north and south, it doesn't fly right off the canvas. So I'm aware of a kind of visual mm-hmm. context. This is a painting. Someone's going to be viewing it, you know, and, and, and they're taking it in. And where am I leading them? Or where's their eye going? And what is it doing to them? And how is it, how is it connecting with these people? You know, you know I, I don't really think so outside in, but, I, but in a way, it's a painting and it, I'm doing it, you know, and I'm putting it out there. So I'm not doing this just because I feel like I could do it and I'm this guy who can do paintings and, and that. So I feel there's a, a vibrational, whoops, sorry about that, a, a vibrational purpose and a, a purpose to raise the vibration in the viewer. For- it's making me realize, talking to you, that artists really do see the world a little bit differently, that you're seeing spaces and... Oh, yeah. That's so time. interesting. And we forget. We're kind of in our own little <laughs> bubble. We're like, you know, someone could be walking and talking about something, and I'm like, that's amazing with those flowers. And, <laughs> and they have to pull me back down to earth and, like, say, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, that is kind of cool, but we're talking about this. <laughs> and Yeah, yeah. Did you have any dark days of... Oh, yeah. And so how'd you get through those? I did a lot of spiritual, you know, you know, trolling and looking deeper. And uh, I, I looked at it as tests. I did believe in myself. It wasn't that I was doubting myself, but the dark days were the reality of what was going on. Oh, yeah, I mean, I had trouble paying rents at times, you know, things that people go through. Um, and... Um, I also promoted more Mm -hmm. when I was really having a hard time and just put my energy in that and then um, connected more. I I decided to go the opposite way rather than shrivel up and just, you know, I mean, I probably had, and I had a couple cats that were pretty good to me (laughs) (laughs) that were perfect and they they understood everything no matter what I did. So they they were good. (laughs) Yeah, they were, they were fine if I just hung out with them. It was good enough. So there was that. There was, you know, and there was there was a lot of people uh, also uh, supported me and came through. A lot of friends early on. They bought paintings when I was selling them at three hundred dollars. You know, and uh, I had a sale once. I thought it was I just decided to sell all my paintings. This is pre-internet really kicking in. Pre-cell phones. So I had to get on the phone and call people and tell them I was doing this thing oh, and wow. come over, you know. And marketing art is another planet. It's like this. And creating art <laughs> is like this. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe because I'm a guy, I, it was not hard for me to compartmentalize and know the difference. But um, even in that, you know, not to look back, it wasn't even that long ago, but technologically it was um, as an example I'd have to send out slides to galleries oh, 35 wow. millimeter slides and I'd have to send a page of slides times 10 maybe 10 mm-hmm. galleries with self-addressed envelopes and hope for the best right. so that was um, so things took longer and but um I did have a lot of people come through for me in a lot of different ways, and they sensed something. They liked the art. Maybe it wasn't even there yet, you know, but they supported me, not just because they liked me, but I think they supported me because they were interested and probably wanted in on something early and that kind of thing. So. Well, and your faith in theirs paid off. It did. It has so far, yeah, so far. You had a great year. I've had a great couple years, yeah. Yeah, it's been good since uh, even before the pandemic was, you know, I had, uh, you know, it still happens. We had a hard time probably in 2017, 2018, 
And then I turned it around big time. I decided to promote and do some, try some different things. And some of them worked and some didn't. I was doing art fairs, uh, the other art fair, Barker Hanger. I did things I'd never done, you know, before. And sometimes it's good to try that and to just try something um, that doesn't make sense logically. And for me, what that does 900% of the time is it, something else shows up. And while it's not directly related, I'm positive it shows up because you suddenly are acting in a different way mm. and new things can enter into your life. Yeah, I, I agree 100% that that part that feels like creativity feels very antithetical to the part that needs to promote and market. Right. What, what does a right. what does a regular or a typical day look like, and how do you, do you can you do both things in one day? Do you have to have separate time set up? I have a fun. Yeah, I mean, a typical day. I don't know if there is a typical day. Certainly, I love coffee. You know, that's that's well documented. <laughs> I write some stuff down. Maybe I have it written down from the day before. I try to see this is the marketing part or whatever, communications part, I try to see things through. Even if I don't want to do it, I, I, I sometimes say, all right, just write, you know, and usually the act of doing it is not a big deal. Right. It's like doing laundry that, you know, or sitting there for a week or something, you know, it's like, it's not that big a deal. So, um, so that's, I, I do that. I try to do it sometimes before like 11 or something like that. Um, depending on the time of year, like this time of year, the light is very long, and I like to paint in daylight. So for me, magic time's about four to seven, you know, to paint. Mm. Sometimes I procrastinate and wait till four thirty, you know, and do one last thing or whatever. So there's that. But I prepare for that. I prepare the canvases, uh, the paints. I know what I'm going to be doing. Um, and... Um, so that's part of the typical day. Then I have other things going on. I have studio visits. I have uh, talks with gallery. I get my gallery and different people. Um, right now, I have uh, many shows going on right now. Uh, in Rome, I, I, I show two pieces. In Japan, I have two pieces. There's logistics of getting work back and forth. Yeah. And what's, uh, you know, and there's, there's uh, communications. Someone wrote me this morning. There's a publication coming out at the end of the year from the Rome show. I didn't really know about that. So there's that. There's social media, too, to promote a little bit like that. So all that exists sometimes during the day. I try not to take it too seriously, even though I am serious about it. So I have a high desk, a very high kind of... And I just kind of like put my computer up there and kind of like, I'm kind of like playing with it because mm. <laughs> I make it fun. Right. And so that's part of the day. Then um, obviously taking care of yourself, like, you know, doing some kind of exercise, a walk. And I, I don't know how people that are working nine to five, like all the time, I don't know how they live because it's brutal to get stuff done, just regular household stuff mm. done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I respect them greatly. But I mean, there's that too. And um, and so I do all that. And the actual painting, um, I, um, I totally, you know, give over to it. And um, I make sure that I have certain clothes that I have there just for that, because I ruin every, mm. just about every pair of clothes I have. And uh, so that's a little bit of my typical day. Do you ever have days when you just don't feel like painting? Yeah. And so what do you do? I don't. Sometimes I don't paint, but I paint most days. I'm always working on my art, even when I'm walking to the grocery mm -hmm. store. I am always, I'm in that mode. Uh, not because I feel like I have to. I'm totally in the skin of an artist, so I take things in, there's always information, there's always surprises, there's always things, you know, that I don't even know, like that poem, I have no idea how I found it. And, and the Italians I know are like, oh my God, that we all learned that in school, and you know, and it's like this profound poem. And so um, I'm always, uh, I'm fairly open to, uh, to, to, to you know, my surroundings. So if you had any advice, yeah. to give students or listeners sure. who really wanted to make a life as an artist but feel like it, 
it can be hard, or I don't have anyone in my family who's done it, or I don't know right. how to start. What would you say? Well, A, it's not genetic, even though my mother's an artist. I didn't mean to imply yeah, yeah, that. No, no, <laughs> uh, no, I didn't think you did. I didn't think you did, but it's not. So they need to let that go. Good. And um, uh, actually, my own mother didn't have a group of artists in her family, and she's you know, mm. just very different. So I think my advice is one is you need to take care of yourself. It's a job to take care of yourself. Physically, you need to be in good form. It's physical art to make art. So if you're feeling good physically, that's that you want to give yourself the best opportunity and chance to make good art. If you're going to the effort to make art, don't pretend like you're going through the effort to make art. Right. Make an effort. When you make an effort, you show up. So you do everything possible to be present, whether it's meditation or prayer or silence or music or whatever it is that does it for you. Go there and go in deep. No one's watching. There's no audience. There is no audience. There's no, it's you, which makes it both challenging and exciting. So you have to do everything possible to take care of you, including your body, like I said. And um, you should be doing some kind of practice, whether it's uh, yoga or tennis or something that just keeps you, your, your, gets your blood going, okay? So then you can have endurance. Regardless, you know, when you're younger, you can power through with energy and adrenaline and coffee, but that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. And so when you make marks, when you go to paint, when you go, let's just say as a painter, you are ready and you're making real purposeful, you know, you don't have to run around circles and do this and this and that, and you get better and more articulate. Mm. So that's one effort. The second thing, you know, I brought these, like I don't even know what's going on with these, but I'm doing these cubes. Someone right. gave me 150 maple cubes. So I'm just playing. I don't know what's gonna be with these. Maybe nothing, and this just might be all error that I'm telling you. But it's interesting to me, they're six-sided. There could be potentially six paintings. Uh, if I have a bunch of them, maybe the people that, that get them can self-curate. Mm. So you have to have a sense of play. You know, I mean, this is just an example, but a sense of play and lightness to get deep. And that's key. And you need to make space and time for this to happen. If you're always singing the song, I don't have time, mm. I don't have the space, I don't have a studio, then there you are. That's exactly what you have. Mm. I know people that have made incredible art in their frickin' closets. Incredible. New Yorkers that have no, you know, they can't afford it. So, so that is the other thing I wanted to say. So. Uh, and um, you don't need, uh, when I said no audience, you don't need, uh, validation is good, but self-validate. Mm -hmm. And love it, just really love it. It comes through. People, people respond, they don't know why it comes through. If you love what you're doing, even if they don't like a painting or a work, okay. I don't like all my work I do. But That's beautiful, I love that. I'm passionate about what I do and I think that people that are passionate about creating, when you create, it's it, it, right now. It's it, it's such a it's such an incredible thing to be able to do because it translates to everything. The world's complicated. I don't need to. That doesn't need to be said. You can create solutions. You can create new things that never existed, that no one ever imagined, that would create solutions if solutions are needed. Um, it's such a, uh, an asset that is uh, such an X factor that people only recognize it when they see it. So do everything to nurture it. Joshua, thank you so much for being with us today. Okay. It's wonderful. Loved it. <laughs>